Alternators. Alternators. We're rocking with yeah. Robert. I, what was that? I didn't hear you. No, no. no. I guess I guess we're okay. It's hard to yeah. tell. It's hard to tell here if you guys are talking to me or talking about me. <laughs> Either. Either. Yeah. Okay. So wiring diagrams. I'm going to close that. We're into the, back into the binder. Back into the book. The D. Yeah, the exact but the test the test yeah. will be yeah so that, it's fine. Right here. Check forward here. We will do HVAC Saturday morning. Saturday morning. From eight to nine. Okay? Okay. I know your book says HVAC, but I just have material on my computer. We're gonna do that Saturday morning. Uh, real quick, real quick, there's usually only five <coughs> questions on the exam, so I don't want to beat that horse to death. Okay. Um, we all do air conditioning. We all know how HVAC works. Motors. We'll do that Saturday morning, an hour, an hour and a quarter, and then into the exam. We really want you guys to get the feel of the exam. Okay. 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 Taking your personal experience at what we review here, and we'll go yeah. from there. Today we are working on. If we look at what's on my agenda um, over here, um, on this part of my screen. We did electrical, we're not doing HVAC, we're working on, we're starting on what we were supposed to do tomorrow, and what I had scheduled for Saturday, we're going to move into tomorrow. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to spend the rest of the day talking about tires, wheels, suspension, alignment components. I'm not going to tell you how to do an alignment, we're going to discuss what an alignment is, that's about it. Okay? Okay. Um, we're going to discuss electric assist steering. And the TPMS. TPMS, really important that we understand that, that we all that we're all on the same page. So let's why do we have TPMS? Why do we have tire pressure monitoring systems? Tire TPMS, another acronym, okay? If Buddy in States drove a car with a flat tire and didn't know that, he had no air. <laughs> essentially, yes. That's just a joke. <laughs> no, but essentially, if you go back, I've, I've researched this. Why does this mean? He's super kind of the manufacturer. Essentially, why we have tire pressure monitoring is, is exactly what, what Uncle said, is that there was lawsuits happening in the States. And people were driving their Ford Broncos, and, and it was Ford Broncos, on their Firestone tires, and they were driving down the highway, and they had tire pyrosis, tire exploded, yeah. and they said it was a fault of the tire and the fault of the suspension on the truck. And so there was a huge lawsuit, and it lasted for years and years, between the class action suit, there was several people, and when several people sue a company, it's called a class action suit. Yeah. So there was a class action suit against the tire company. I think it was Bridgestone. Firestone. 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 Yeah. Now they're owned by Bridgestone, but it was Firestone. Yeah. yeah. Against the tire company and against the car companies saying that you have put a faulty product in there and bothered and, and impinged our lives, affected our lives. There was loss of death and then the car burned and Really terrible, terrible. I remember those. those. Yeah, I remember, no, I remember reading about them, and people were afraid to drive. It was a major reason. So they tracked the solution down that the tires were that the tires were underinflated, and if you drive the tire underinflated, you get overheat. Yes. Let's see if I can. The tire. How's that show? There you go. <laughs> Perfectly circled. The tire rolled because because I, I don't trust this thing. It's just taking too long. So I'm trying to so bear with me. If it works good, we applause later. Okay. Tire. Trump. Pardon me. Yeah. I know you've got to look at my shiny. Yeah. 
car traveling down the road this direction. Okay. Can you see this in Surrey? Yeah. Okay. Traveling in this direction in an inflated, properly inflated situation. The tire's slightly flat on the bottom here. The contact patch is flat on the road, right? That's the weight of the tire. So that's what we call the contact patch, is that, that rectangular area of the tire that touches the road. Okay? And our tread on it. So that's the only part. That's where our heat develops. Okay, if the tire is properly inflated, the air inside the tire and the air that rushes past the outside of the tire is sufficient to cool it down. Correct. And it keeps the tire in drop. It keeps the tire around. Okay. So what happens, and all the heat is developed where I have put these two lines. Start to wear the Okay. Don't, don't get out. Don't get ahead, please. Sorry. Okay? That's where our heat develops, and where our heat is dissipated is inside the air of the tire, which heats the outside walls of the tire, and then it goes to atmosphere, the air. And it's sufficient to keep the tire cool. Right? We all know that we measure our tire pressure when the tires are warm. Right? Correct. Right? We don't measure our tires when it's 30 below and then drive to Saskatchewan. Right? Because our tires warm up and they'll expand. And don't do like my brother, he put in 15 psi too much and he broke the belts on his tire when he was 100 miles from home. It cost him 44. <laughs> yeah. um, so, what happened? What the tire manufacturers and the car manufacturers, let's go back to why these cars were flipping, like going down the road, there'd be an explosion and they'd flip off the highway and end up on their roof. But, where we had all these terrible things. What the tire manufacturers and the auto manufacturers said was that it was a tire inflation problem. When we run a tire on under inflated, we get something that's called a standing weight. If we take our rim, oops, okay, with our studs holding the rim on, we get part of the tire that literally ends up with a wide, a line like that. There's a, there's a, the tire buckles, the sidewall buckles, and we call that a standing weight, because as this tire rolls down the road, that standing wave is always visible on the tire. The tire's spinning like this, and you can see that standing wave. Because the tire's getting hot. Because the tire's getting hot. And there are videos on there. If you key up, go to YouTube tonight and look at Standing Wave. There's actually a really good video of uh, where you can see the Standing Wave and they run the tire until it blows up. And that is why that Standing Wave, the tire heats up. Every time that tire comes around, it's got a flex to create that wave. Right? And then it comes around again and it's got a flex. And it's that flexing of the rubber that breaks it up inside. We've all done tires and we've all seen tires where the customer has run on a flat. Right? Mm -hmm. Look at the inside of the tire, a customer car that's run on a flat. If, if, you're, if you're doing it correctly and putting patches on, okay, you've got to take the tire off. Yeah. The patch on. You look at the inside of the tire, where did all that rubber come from? Right? The dust. From the excess flexing that it's dust, right? Tire comes around on the bottom, it's got a flex to make it flat, and when it comes around the side, it opens up again. If you if you flex and unflex the inside of the tire, the rubber's gonna flake off. That's what the filing is. That's what happened, right? And that's where all the rubber filings come is from the tire flexing. And if you if you take apart tires that have been underinflated and run for a couple of hundred kilometers, you'll find that same dust. Yeah, inside the tire. Yeah. So if you take this tire and you start getting that standing wave, too much heat and, and the pressure expands, then we're heating the air that's inside the tire beyond the capability. Then the tire explodes, and then the tire goes off the road. So tire companies and the car companies, 
25 years ago at least. At least 25 years ago. And beyond that. And beyond that. Defended that. And then they came in, they said, we need tire pressure monitor. First of all, you need to monitor the tire pressure. It's critical to have to do it. And then the auto manufacturers built in this system into the car so that we no longer have this standing wave that's going to happen on the car. I have somewhere at home a link to a video about standing wave. Now, Larry, yeah. on these TPMS, yeah. older models, uh, you've seen them on GMs, yeah. they tie them into the anti lock brake system under the wheel speed sensor. So yeah. if the tire goes low, you yeah. can change the rotation, so you get a different rotation on the tire. That's well, right. that big. So that was one of the first. first one of the first ones. And it's yeah. very effective. Yeah, it works. It's very effective. Mike Moon brought it up that we've got, as our, some of the earlier, bring it up again. Let's see if it works twice now. That we tie in. We have our wheel speed sensor. It's telling us how fast the tire is rotating. And if our tire is flat, the radius will be larger. And it will give us a sine wave because our tire, our wheel speed sensor puts out a sine wave on an AC voltage, right? Yeah. It's going to be the same as our friend, the alternator that we talked about yeah, 45 minutes ago. Okay. So with that sine wave, with the amount of ripples, we know how fast that tire is running. And if we have an underinflated tire is going to rotate at a different speed than a properly inflated tire, and it must mean that we've got a pressure problem. That yeah. was the, what some of the very first, it was actually pretty reliable. Yeah, it was actually works. pretty reliable. Um, you said we have this track wide. <laughs> that was one of the first systems. That's right. Then we came in with um, the onboard ones. The onboard ones. And we've got our, our rim, we'll put our tire around it, and oh, I'm such a bad driver. <laughs> such a bad driver. Um, through the stem, through the valve stem, on the inside of the valve stem, we are going to put my friend here. The same as a map sensor, the same as the sensor we put on the bridge to see if the structure is flexing. My friend, the the piezo, pardon me, and the knock sensor. My friend, the piezo sensor, who's going to react to stress, and the more it stresses, the higher voltage it puts out. And if it's putting out a voltage, it's putting out an RF signal, right? And then I just have to pick it up with an antenna in either wheel. Wireless, yeah, wireless. Wireless. But I already have an antenna built into the car. Correct. Right? Yes. Not the radio antenna. I need something much more sensitive than that. And that's my, my keyless entry. That antenna. I can, I can make it as sensitive as I want, right? Because the customer, the signal, can do it from 30 meters away. Correct. Right? Yeah. Why don't I use the signal coming off my tire pressure valve stems? Okay. Piezo crystal putting out around an RF signal. Why don't I use my door lock module to talk to my EVS module to say I've got a low tire pressure? That's how it works, guys. Well, they have their own, don't they? But they need their own module. They, you know what? So yeah. why? Yes, TPS is its own module. Yeah. But it's piggybacking. Yeah. It's piggybacking on the door lock. Yeah. Module to receive it. So door lock. So how are all these modules talking? Quick. Wireless. You say A, B, C, or D. Okay. Wireless. Through the radio. 
you turn the light on or are they using can line? All of them. They're using can line. Yeah. So our modules, our modules are all tied into can. Yeah. Why not use the can line? Okay. Can line. Rather than send another a radio signal from our valve stem to our door lock module to our TPS module. Now we got too many radio signals going around where we don't want radio signals because we've got microcomputers that react to them. So we want to keep it nice, level, and stable. We use batteries internally and in charge. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. dozens of so different many. ways. Yeah. There are so many different ways. There's tire I saw when I was at Mercedes. Yeah. When I was forming at Mercedes, tire pressure module. How, why the guy paid money for this, I don't know, but it cost him a seven hundred dollar tire. Take the tire off, tire pressure module, and hold it on with a strap yes. and, a, and, a, and a screw. Well, the strap broke. The guy drove over, over a curb. Yeah. The guy drove over a curb. Tire flattened. Yeah. Broke the TPS module, and and then the strap was just rattling around, and all that steel. Yeah. It didn't last very long inside the rim. Okay, why do that? Why do that? Why well, not just buy too, Larry? Pardon me? Ford uses the same, the older Ford is. Yeah, yeah the, the sensor in the middle of the wheel. Like it's the opposite direction of the belts that one he needs to be off. But these sand waves, and they're, you gotta really go with the spec. Some of yeah. them are programmable, some of them yeah. are not. Some of the aftermarket ones, they have uh, self-encoding. Some of them yep. you can't. Some of them you have to use the, the OEM spec. I always yep. go with the fact that- And there's so much out there. Oh there's yeah, so much tons. out there. There's tons. Yeah. My favorite one is keep it at the OEM, like you get them from factory, right yep. from the dealerships. And this way you can still program them with your machine and they're done. You don't have a yeah. problem. You don't have a they're only good for eight years, that's it. They have a lifespan? Yeah, the batteries are not very good on everything I've watched. Yeah. After eight years, if you do an entire change over, just go set in there. GM was the one of the first one that dropped their prices on it for only 25 bucks. Cheap yeah. job. It's, it's not worth a customer calling back. Not worth messing with. We all we just finished discussing yeah. class action suits. Exactly. That was. No. types of tire pressure sensors. They actually had a, a cross-sectional view in here on page, on page 234, cross-sectional view. We can see the piezo crystal directly underneath the, uh, under the valve. See, it tells you and it's exposed. Yeah. It is exposed to the pressure that's inside the little pinhole on there. Uh, there's a torque for the for the nut that holds it to the rim. Better torque on the right, otherwise you're pre-stressing the module. Yeah, there's a lot of sets up on the battery light. Pardon me? Not replaceable battery powers. Yeah, it's a sensor. But projective battery life is 10 years or 160,000 K. That's right. Like, so whatever comes off first. 
So after 10 years, or 160,000. So we got customers for 90,000 K. That's not true. 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 So they transmit the radio frequency containing the yeah, entire information and then relay one or more receivers obtain the RF signal and then relay the information to the TPS control module. And that's all done by CAN. So radio signal, then send it by CAN to the TPS module, maybe to the ABS module, then to the cluster to the PCM and from the PCM to the cluster to the IPC. There's lots of acronyms. There's a lot of work going on to change those lights, to turn those lights on. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, turn the Christmas light on. Yeah. Um, different processes, how to turn them on, how to turn them off. I'm sorry, how to turn them off. Use your service information. Indirect monitoring, wheel speeds, so that would be a typical question that they're going to show you, okay? Technician A says that the wheel speed, uh, tire pressure monitor said the TPMS sensor will send an RF signal to be picked up to relay to turn on the light. Technician B will say that it can also be uh, an indirect monitoring system through the wheel speed sensor, okay? You have to know what an indirect system is. That's going to be the key. Otherwise, you're going to get there. You're going to see the question. You're going to say, hmm, Larry only spoke about an RF signal. So you have to know that there's an indirect signal. The indirect signal is the wheel speed sensor for the ABS. Indirectly, it will also tell that there's a wheel speed. The indirect is both the outside, right? The outside, right? The the outside. Is outside, it's looking for tire rotation Correct. speed. The indirect is the yes. over one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Actually, some manufacturer will back that one now, the newer ones. It's more reliable in, in my, yeah. 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 more reliable, less maintenance. It doesn't, <coughs> is it that important that we're two PSI off? With our climate change, yeah. it's just not. Is it, realistically, realistically, you know, if you put the tire to 32 PSI or 30 PSI, we're really not going to get that standing weight at, at the two PSI difference, right? right? And you can drive from here to Tuck the Tuck and have no problems and not damage your tire. Yeah. TPMS tire pressure sensors, in my estimation, are, that's not our discussion, in my estimation, are a little too sensitive sometimes because they want all the tires at 30 PSI. <laughs> yeah. Body cannot feel the vibration of the car tire. <laughs> Basically, okay, system service, page 237. When you break the tire off the rim, okay, we're always going to be expecting that the tire pressure sensor is going to be behind the valve, okay? So we're going to want to break the tire off the rim at least 90 degrees away from that. Yeah, I would do 180 degrees. But so part of what we want to do, we want to really care for the customer's car. You want to break that sensor? Yes. Yeah. If the valve stem is aluminum and has an aluminum retaining nut, this indicates that there's a tire pressure sensor behind there. Don't want to with that. I. I know. So, different means, different ways, and I included this. You're probably not going to see any of these pictures on the exam. I included it because it's hard information to find how many are out there. On page 240, a couple of different aftermarket tools how to, how to reset. They are reset, they are indicator tools. Um, TPMS diagnosis, let's look at that on page 241. Indirect tire pressure monitor faults relate to either a wheel speed sensor or an ABS control module failure. Yeah. Okay. Technician A will say something like that probably. Yeah. Um, 
If either of these components fails, the ABS warning light illuminates. Diagnose these faults using the applicable ABS diagnostic trouble code. So it's not necessarily going to turn on a TPMS light, it'll turn on an ABS light. So bear that in mind when your customers are coming to you, right? Because they have an ABS light and you're a little too busy and say, well, you still have your standard brakes and send them down the road. Because the lawyers are going to say, you're responsible. Right. So if we need to be looking at all these goals all the time. You need to make the time, even if it's just take care of yourself. What are you doing? The indirect usually usually sets uh, light. The light will come. But the possibility if yeah. it is indirect. Yeah. The older systems just used to turn on the ABS. Okay. They didn't have the light here in the Yeah. I've never seen those ones. I've seen yeah. the one that has all light. it was. So you know, if the ABS light comes in, it is safety related. Take care of your customer. Take care of yourself. Yeah. And that's off the exam. Or no, that's away from the exam. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Direct tri tire pressure monitor failures result in the TPMS light illuminating and or a message appearing in the driver information system. The module containing the TPMS software requires a DTC when it detects a fault. The module also partially or completely disable the TPMS depending on the fault. Follow the manufacturers for proceeding for procedures for diagnosing the, TP, the DTC. Too many acronyms. So what it says here is that when there's a code that is set in the TPMS, it disables all other T diagnostics. Yeah, so you can have one tire that is low pressure and the TPMS module will ignore signals from the other three tires until you solve that problem. Correct. Diagnose pressure sensor DTC with a scan tool. Monitor the scan tool while using the sensor activation tool. If the sensor does not activate and send that into the module, the sensor is faulty. Check the accuracy of the sensor with the scan tool. Compare the scan tool pressure reading to reading from a quality tire pressure gauge. So what they're saying there, um, you got to compare yes, sure, with the sensor is faulty. That's right. Sensor activation tool, that's what I want to talk about. Yeah. We all remember, or I remember vividly, the Cadillac sensor activation tool, which was just a magnet. <laughs> right? And it was a horseshoe magnet that we would put over the sensor when we were in diagnostic mode. Yeah. Okay? When you were in diagnostic mode with the key in the run position and the TPMS in diagnostic, you would walk around with this magnet and put it over the sensor. So the magnetic field would have go through, yes, would negate the signal and the car would sound the horn for you. Okay, you got a problem on the sensor. Right, you would cancel it. You, would all, you were also verifying: is the sensor capable of sending a signal? And that, that was one way of diagnosing, diagnosing that. That was one way of diagnosing it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you just got a new set of tires, and now it's going to cost you three sensors because your apprentice didn't watch out when he took the tires off and he broke them. I replaced them on my cost. Yeah. Cost of doing business, right? Exactly. That's why you're making 30 bucks a tire. If all four sensors are not sending data, faulty sensors are not the cost. It's all what they're saying. Be a model. It's like my friend here with the uh, camshaft activation solenoid, right? If you put two on, you still got the same problem. It's probably not a sensor. Module that receives the radio signal or the TPMS control module could also likely be the cause. Radio frequency interference also causes intermittent problems with the tire pressure monitor faults. Aftermarket accessories or outside interference may be the source of this. Yeah, exactly. Like what? What could interfere with that? Um, well, if you use like a, a GPS, if you use a like an aftermarket uh, Bluetooth setup, anything. You guys in the oil industry with uh, uh, 
the recipes, the, the radios, and the radio. yes, lights. Everybody's got a mic on them now, right? Yeah, there you go. Lots of RF happening. Yeah. Okay. Steering angles. Spindle, 
and we would attach, there was a tool that we would screw onto a spindle, yeah. and it had a bar on it with a level, yeah. max two levels yeah. on it, yeah. and, and you would adjust your alignment that way. That's interesting. Kingpin inclination. Yeah. Yeah. And then we went to the high-tech Hunter came out with Hunter, yeah. um, heads that you would mount to the wheels. That's and they had not lasers, it was just really bright lights. Exactly. The lights bars, and, and then you had sliding boards that exactly. you would adjust according to the width of your car. <laughs> they didn't have to lift every, every yeah. wheel that's spinning back. Somebody with a foreman head. would come by to talk to you, and he'd hit one bar, and, and then you'd, you'd, you'd have to start over yeah. again. <laughs> you'd hit one plate, because we had giant plates with we have degrees on them. You see, when, 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 we, when I do now, I don't have to shut off the, the heater because they interrupt the, uh, the lights too, right? The flutters with the lights. Yeah, not exactly why it's the heat in the heat that makes the, 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 the heads misreading or jumping like from, really, yeah. from yeah. one degree to another. That's, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And then, then I figure out it's, it must be the heat. So I, I killed huh? the uh, heater on that side, that side, and I got perfect steady. Numbers. I don't know. takes a pamphlet for the new alignment machine, and I don't need that this year. <laughs> exactly. Those are the solutions you don't want to find, right? You'd rather have eat than not. Okay. Caster. So we talked about we talked about steering axis. <laughs> Well, we used to call the kingpin inclination, steering axis, back in the day. Caster describes the forward or rearward tilt of the steering axis viewed from the side of the vehicle. Caster is a directional control angle. Positive is the rearward tilt. Zero means it's straight up, vertical. Negative caster is the forward tilt. And that's off center of the vehicle. If we're looking at our vehicle from on top, positive would be coming towards the middle of the car, negative would be tilting away, tilting away towards the car, towards the car. So away and put center. Okay, and there's a good, included a lot of papers with this one because some people have trouble with it. People don't think caster is important when you do it on all alignment. Uh -huh. It's actually more than what people think. It, yes. Yes. My theory is have an exact right bang on the dot with a number in the front. That's the exact number that's set to toe at the end. Ease of steering. Ease, you know. The camera, if it's off half a degree, I'm not agreeing really yeah. much because of yeah. 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 the sewage system. Yeah. Go. Okay. Yeah. That's your goal. Exactly. But you know that caster very religiously. <laughs> so, positive caster increases the vehicle's tendency to go straight. <coughs> Tilting the steering axis rearward projects the load on the wheel. Ahead of the center of the tire contact patch. There's that word again, contact patch. The footprint on the road. The center of the tire footprint, that's exactly what it is. You get a, you get a Corvette gear back tire and that contact patch is like that big. It's the size of the book. The center of the footprint is the point of contact. The spot of the weight is being projected is to is the point of load. A good example of positive caster is a bicycle. Ease of steering. 